Good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank you for joining PQA's Quality Forum webinar today. My name is Amanda Ryan, and I am PQA's Director of Education. Our topic today is best practices to support tapering patients on long-term opioid therapy. Before introducing our speakers, I would like to call your attention to three housekeeping items. First, attendees are encouraged to ask questions during the presentation using the questions panel located on the right side of your screen. At the conclusion of the presentation, I will read the questions aloud for our speakers to answer. Second, the webinar recording and slide deck will be distributed within the week following the presentation. And then lastly, I would also like to encourage attendees to complete the quick one minute survey that will appear at the conclusion of the webinar. We invite you to save the date for two upcoming PQA events. Our next quality forum webinar will be on Thursday, February 25th, and we will focus on the Pharmacy Quality Solutions Industry Trend Report in Pharmacy Quality. Our PQA annual meeting will be held online May 11th through the 13th, and we will have additional information for that on you uh, for you on that in the next coming weeks. During today's quality forum, we will begin with backgrounds on the National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative on Countering the U.S. Opioid Epidemic. Next, you will hear highlights from the Action Collaborative's recently published discussion paper, and that focuses on best practices to support tapering patients on long-term opioid therapy, specifically for chronic non-cancer pain in the outpatient setting. And then finally, we'll share a brief overview of PQA's relevant opioid quality measures, and then we'll conclude with our question and answer session. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, we have Aisha Salman. She is the program officer at the National Academy of Medicine and is the interim director of the Action Collaborative on Countering the U.S. Opioid Epidemic. Next is Anna Legrid Dopp, and she is the Senior Director of Clinical Guidelines and Quality Improvement at the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. In this role, she develops therapeutic guidance documents and collaborates with the National Academy of Medicine, the National Quality Forum, the Joint Commission, and Pharmacy Quality Alliance on Quality Improvement Initiatives. We also have with us Robert Chuck Rich, Jr., who serves as a part-time clinician and practice medical director of a facility-owned group, a group practice that serves a rural population in southeastern North Carolina. In that capacity, he holds an academic appointment as adjunct associate professor with the School of Osteopathic Medicine at Campbell University in North Carolina. And we also have Lisa Hines, who is the Vice President of Performance Measurement here at PQA, where she leads PQA's quality strategy. Doctors Legrid Dopp, Rich, and Hines all serve on the National Academy of Medicine's Pain Management Guidelines and Evidence Standards Working Group. And Lisa Hines also serves on the Research, Data, and Metrics Needs Working Group. Thank you to all of us for being here with us today. And with that, I will turn the floor over to Aisha to get us started. Aisha. Excellent, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you um, having us here today. Um, I will be talking about the National Academy of Medicine's Action Collaborative on Countering the U.S. Opioid Epidemic with all of you. Um, just some really quick background on the National Academy of Medicine. We're one of three academies that make up the broader uh, National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, which serve to provide evidence-based information on subjects in science, technology, and health. Um, and we have a few key functions which are most, mostly centered around um, uh, advising, convening, and, and catalyzing diverse stakeholders um, to inform future directions in health and medicine. So what I'll do today is start by speaking briefly about the current opioid crisis, um, and then I'll provide an overview of both the structure and function of the Action Collaborative, and then we'll spend some time uh, focusing specifically on our pain management uh, portfolio in particular. Um, if you could go to the next slide, please. Um, I'll start uh, really quickly. Um, I do wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors. They're listed here on the slide. Um, as they do make our work possible. So thank you to our sponsors, um, as well as our steering committee who leads the strategic direction of the group uh, and of course our dedicated members. 
Next slide, please. Great, so um, I'll start with um, some important statistics on the opioid crisis, um, which I always find are um, really helpful to, um, to look at. And, you know, I think we're all well aware of the enormity of the opioid crisis, but it really can't be underscored enough um, just how large and complex the crisis is. Uh, and of course, it's only been exacerbated by COVID-19. During the pandemic, we have seen an increase in overdose deaths. The CDC found um, that during the 12 month period that ended in May, 2020, um, they found that they had the highest number of drug overdose deaths ever reported in a 12 month period. Uh, and we also know that more than 80% of all drug overdose deaths uh, involve opioids. Um, and so we know that there are, just speaking to impact, um, 130 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose. And if we're looking at the numbers um, of those who are affected by opioid use disorder, in the US alone, we're looking at over uh, 2 million individuals. Um, of course, beyond the, the devastating human toll, we know that the epidemic has greatly impacted the economy as well. A recent report from the White House Council of Economic Advisors estimated that the, uh, the epidemic has cost the nation $2.5 trillion between 2015 and 2018 alone. And then again, with the convergence of the pandemic, with the opioid crisis, we know that um, the economic and social consequences have only multiplied um, for those who have substance use disorders and has impacted not just individuals, but families and communities as well across the country. Due to the complexity of the opioid epidemic um, over the years, there have been numerous efforts and initiatives underway that um, have really emerged at all levels of government, have spanned across sectors uh, to address different aspects of the opioid crisis. Um, and it was uh, well documented that there was a notable lack of coordination um, across some of these approaches and resources. And so we saw an opportunity for the National Academy of Medicine to utilize its platform uh, and convening power uh, to really step in and help align some of these ongoing efforts uh, to ensure that we're advancing the most uh, promising initiatives in um, an effective and efficient way. Next slide, please. So the Action Collaborative was established in 2018 um, and utilized as a, a portfolio approach. Um, it is a public-private partnership that um, provides a, a neutral and independent um, forum that has the capacity to um, collate, assess, and elevate the existing evidence base, um, as well as hiding, highlighting where there are remaining gaps. Um, and an important part of what we do is convene key stakeholders to facilitate um, greater coordination and, and most importantly, collective action um, to combat the opioid crisis. And so today, the Action Collaborative has over 60 participating members that represent um, federal agencies, state and local governments, provider groups, health systems, payers, academia, philanthropy, persons with lived experience, um, and more. We do have a full list available on our website. Um, and we do have incredibly dedicated members. And I do want to quickly acknowledge um, Lisa Hines, Chuck Rich, and Adop, who are all engaged members of the collaborative and contribute greatly to our work. And um, again, special thank you to uh, Lisa for inviting us today and featuring this important work around opioid tapering. So our members drive, <clears throat> excuse me, the work across um, the collaborative. Um, and then the collaborative as a whole is overseen by our steering committee, which includes leadership from the government, healthcare industry, nonprofit and education sectors. So over the last two years, the steering committee has been co-chaired by Dr. Victor Zell, who's the president of the NAM, uh, Admiral Brett Joua, who uh, was the assistant secretary for health at HHS, Ruth Katz from the Aspen Institute, and Jonathan Perlin from HCA Healthcare. Next slide, please. Um, and I wanted to uh, quickly share this map to illustrate the important role that the Action Collaborative has in facilitating this cohesive um, cross-sectoral response to the opioid crisis. Um, and what you'll see here is that we have the Action Collaborative in the center. It's surrounded by 
stakeholder groups that are made up of our membership as well as our expanded network. So you'll see those in the colored circles and those include um, government, health professional associations, um, financing and payment, uh, among others. Just wanted to provide a few examples. And then you'll see that each of those stakeholder groups is connected to um, some specific priority areas, um, which are in that um, middle dotted ring. Um, and then collectively, the, the connections between these groups um, and these priorities are helping to drive the outcomes that you'll see um, in the outermost ring. Um, and I think what this really shows in some ways, is almost the ripple effect um, of the collaborative um, from our from our members and networks and is really indicative of the fact that we truly accomplish more uh, when we work together. Um, and that brings me to my last point about this, um, you know, particular um, diagram, which is to also uh, show that it that it really illustrates the necessity for a system response to address a public health crisis um, like the opioid epidemic um, and underscores the important role that the action collaborative plays within this ecosystem. Next slide, please. So the Action Collaborative's work itself is focused around four core priority areas, which are listed here on the slide, health professional education and training, pain management guidelines and evidence standards, uh, prevention treatment and recovery services, and research data and metrics needs. Um, and uh, these areas were um, really identified through an extensive um, planning process, which um, included stakeholder surveys and meetings um, to really identify where there were still unmet needs uh, that the action collaborative specifically could um, address and add meaningful value to. So that's how these areas were identified. And then um, these uh, priority topics uh, sort of resulted from that are also the focus areas for our working groups. So we have four working groups um, that are focused on each of these areas um, and are um, high impact areas that are needed in response to um, the crisis. And our members, um, again, are very diverse and, um, and, uh, and, and make up a sort of diverse group of uh, individuals uh, for each of, the, each of the working groups. Um, and what I'll do is if we can go um, to the next slide, I'll show how the four working groups come together. Um, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about pain management. So taking our four working groups together, um, this map illustrates how um, our stakeholders, um, our direct members that are convened by the Action Collaborative are collectively addressing the four uh, priority elements of um, our response to the opioid crisis, which I just covered on the previous slide. Um, so within each of these areas, the map highlights the action collaborative specific deliverables and the impact of those of that work. So you'll see the action collaborative again in the center. It's surrounded by uh, our various uh, stakeholders, um, our, our participants um, in the white circles. And then you'll see our four um, working groups um, that are um, outlined um, in these dark blue boxes that are connected to specific work products that belong to each of those areas um, and uh, their respective impacts. So looking at it in totality, you can really see how the Action Collaborative um, is directly contributing to the field and the impact of its work. Um, and what I'll do now is focus specifically on our pain management guidelines and evidence standards working group, which you'll see here um, on the right side of the map. Um, and if we can go to the next slide, I will um, give you some of the details. So the pain management guidelines and evidence standards working group is led by Dr. Helen Burston from the Council for Medical Specialty Societies and Dr. Deborah Horry from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. The aim of this group is to highlight um, and advance opportunities that strengthen critical aspects of pain management, including patient-centered and evidence-based tapering guidance, which I'll expand upon in a minute, um, multidisciplinary uh, pain management approaches, and enhancing um, pain guidelines as well as um, implementation of those guidelines into practice. So with the amount of work that um, has been going on outside of the collaborative to um, really look closely at opioid prescribing guidelines for acute and chronic pain, the working group um, decided to first focus its work on tapering guidelines and evidence-based tapering practices. We've certainly seen um, there have been uh, misinterpretations and misapplications um, of the guidelines that's led to 
um, abrupt um, dose reductions just or discontinuations in lieu of sort of gradual tapering practices and has really impacted the lives of those who suffer from pain. So tapering remains an area um, of important focus for this group um, and an area where we recognize that careful person-centered approaches are needed. Um, and so as a part of you know, this effort, the group has produced an expert author discussion paper, um, which you will hear about in more detail from both from uh, Dr. Dobb as well as Dr. Rich. Um, so in addition to tapering, so really briefly, the, the group is also focused on identifying practice and system level gaps in chronic pain care and pulling together some work on how we can address some of the most salient challenges there. Um, and are also taking um, a really focused look at, look at our pain guidelines um, to see how those can be um, enhanced um, moving forward. Um, and I will emphasize that the group, again, is, is very diverse and, and has members um, across the health system. Um, but also includes persons with lived experience who are really central to this group. And you can see um, that that's reflected in the mission statement for this group as well, because we recognize that the patient really is at the center, um, center of the work that needs to be done around pain management. If we can go to the next slide. So lastly, I'll just expand a little bit further our priorities. Um, as a part of some of the guidelines work that I mentioned, um, the working group is helping to advance some of the recommendations from the National Academy's uh, consensus report on clinical practice guidelines for uh, prescribing acute pre prescribing opioids, excuse me, for acute pain. Um, and that work provided uh, a framework to evaluate existing clinical practice guidelines and also provided recommendations for indications where new guidelines should be developed. So the working group will um, is working to bring together those recommendations from the report along with additional evidence from the field to, um, to advance this work. And then for our chronic pain work, which I mentioned, the group held um, several listening sessions um, with clinicians and patients uh, with chronic pain to better understand the state of chronic pain management and again, bring awareness to some of the intended and unintended consequences of changes to the opioid prescribing guidelines um, and uh, that work is, is being put into um, a, a person-centered journey map and will be a tool that will be intended for patients, clinicians, as well as other key stakeholders uh, within the health system. And then, of course, I mentioned the tapering paper, um, and that paper uh, really builds on um, a public webinar, uh, which is available, again, on our website. It was held in July 2019. Um, with a range of, of experts um, and focuses on um, elevating best practices for tapering, tapering, as well as highlighting where further research um, is needed. Um, and of course, making sure that tapering decisions are made collaboratively between clinicians and patients. And I really can't emphasize that last point enough. Um, and we, uh, since the publication of that paper, have been working on disseminating um, and building on some of the key messages of the paper. So we held a webinar with the American Academy of Family Physicians last month to talk about practical applications of shared decision making um, as a part of the tapering process. And then today is another example um, of an effort to share and build upon some of the work in the paper. So thank you so much for your time. I will now hand the presentation over um, to my colleague, Dr. Dopp, to um, talk about the paper. Thank you so much. Hi, good afternoon. And thanks so much to the PQA team for inviting us to speak on this topic and um, just like to commend you for highlighting this as a resource. And, and Aisha, um, really nice to hear your comments. And I'd just like to acknowledge that your efforts with the Action Collaborative over the last two years has been really incredible. You and the entire NAM team are, are exceptional and um, you've highlighted how all the all the deliverables that have come forward, but that's thanks to the dedication of you and your team in advancing the portfolio of objectives that these working groups have identified and then putting those resources into the hands of healthcare professionals, policymakers, and patients. And it was also shared earlier that PQA's own Lisa Hines is an active, active contributor to two of the working groups. And um, I'd like to share that someone else that, that we all know and admire, Ann Burns, who is the Vice President of Professional Affairs of, at the American Pharmacists Association. 
and a member of the PQA Board of Directors is, is another pharmacist colleague that's contributed significantly to the Action Collaborative. And as Aisha's slides demonstrated, the expertise and commitment and collaborative spirit of the entire Action Collaborative has advanced some really important work towards ensuring pain is managed while still countering the opioid epidemic. But in turn, it not but, and, and it has in turn informed programming and the development of resources in our own respective national pharmacy organizations. Next slide, please. Aisha mentioned earlier that one of the early objectives for the pain management guidelines and evidence standards working group was to be on the lookout for unintended consequences of guidelines. And PQA members as measure experts are certainly in tune with anticipating and monitoring unintended consequences. And perhaps one of the best case studies that we all, that quickly comes to mind when we think about unintended consequences in pain management and within the opioid space was the 2016 CDC guideline for prescribing opioids for chronic pain. It brought forward a lot of really important recommendations and clarity in the space. Uh, however, there are some um, that cite that guideline for a rigid application of limits on prescribed morphine milligram equivalents um, that could have influenced policies and practices that led to the unintended consequences of abrupt tapering or discontinuation of opioid therapy. And so very early on, the NAM working group had a tapering guidance in mind as a resource that would help balance that and provide some safeguards around those uh, practices for the, for the sake of patient safety. And so in very, or, very short order, the NAM facilitated a listening session and this listening session had interprofessional perspectives from physicians, from pharmacists, and Burns contributed to this listening session, patients, and, um, and someone with legal expertise. And they, they summarized that, um, as we know, there's not a lot of information or, or evidence on best practices for tapering, and that there is a need for more randomized controlled trials, but in the meantime, advancing some promising practices around um, safe and efficacious protocols would be welcomed. And so on the next slide, um, the listening session helped to inform the discussion paper that was published in August and that we were discussing today. The purpose of this paper is to provide tapering strategies for specific patient populations of long-term opioid use that are being treated for chronic non-cancer pain in outpatient settings as a harm reduction strategy for opioid use and pain management. On the next slide, um, the paper outlines a number of critical areas, many of which Dr. Rich will speak to next, but I'll briefly draw your attention to some of the medication related content that's in the paper and can be found in the paper. The paper um, discusses the use of non-opioid medications from, for pain management, trying to support those multimodal pain management efforts, medication support for managing symptoms of withdrawal, steps to consider for an approach to tapering, and tapering in the setting of concomitant use of opioid analgesics, benzodiazepines, and other CNS depressants. And on the next slide, to get a little bit more granular, there are some key points for considering, um, for considering the utilization of medications that will support patients um, from uh, any symptoms of withdrawal where the paper outlines some rationale, things to consider between a healthcare professional and a patient when that decision has been made to taper. And so it sets some expectations about um, the fact that if, if left untreated, there, the withdrawal symptoms may risk a chance of the patient needing to re-escalate their dosage. It sets expectations as to when symptoms will occur, when they may peak, and how they present. And then it outlines medication op options for mild to moderate withdrawal management and also moderate to severe withdrawal. And, and this is a, clearly an area for pharmacists to influence, to educate patients and other healthcare team members on options to best support patients with medications during a taper. On the next slide, we, we found as we were wrapping up 
the paper that it would be nice to provide an, an algorithm. And so I won't spend a lot of time on this slide, but just to let you know that it's out there to help provide an approach for that decision making between a, a clinician and a patient. And so that's also available in the paper. And the, my last few slides, I guess, get into a bit of the why. So I gave you the what, but this is this is the why to emphasize one of the underlying goals as to why we are contributing to the Action Collaborative, and that's to um, utilize and leverage pharmacists where they can be used in pain management and opioid stewardship strategies. And so um, the next two slides have been graciously shared with us by Dr. Liz Bentley. Many of you know Liz through her leadership on the PQA measure update panel. She's uh, and her team at Kaiser Permanente uh, Northwest. Liz is the director of clinical pharmacy services in the Northwest region. And she's also a co-chair of the Controlled Substances Stewardship work, work Group. So she's an expert that we go to a lot. Um, but this slide highlights the a pharmacist-led opioid tapering program, which is called STORM, which stands for Support Team On-Site Resource for Management of Pain. This program is aimed at addressing high rates of opioid use, alleviate, alleviating the demand on the primary care team, primary care physicians, and then of course, um, improving outcomes. The, the team published a paper in this last year, and so perhaps you can add this as a resource to look at um, in addition to the tapering paper that we're talking about today. You can see based on this algorithm that once a patient is identified as a candidate for opioid tapering, the primary care provider has an option to refer to the STORM program where the pharmacist leads a, a team, which is also in collaboration with a nurse and a social worker to initiate care for a patient and provide so, uh, support during the tapering process. On the next slide, you can see that they've been tracking the results for over a decade, actually. What you see on this slide is for the years of uh, 2018 to 2020, but you can see that um, thanks to the efforts on STORM from baseline to, di to discharge and three months and even sustained throughout six months, uh, patients experience on average a greater than 50% reduction in their, in their average daily MME. And they sustain this even through COVID-19. Um, so that's really remarkable based on some of the headlines that we've been seeing about uh, opioid use during, during the pandemic. Uh, on the next slide, I'll, I'll just share with, with one other resource to make available. This was published last July, thanks to significant effort and, and meaningful contribution of, of uh, an interprofessional panel of experts that were brought together to identify actionable solutions, tools, and resources um, to, work, to work towards addressing the, the opioid epidemic while and through engagement of pharmacists as medication therapy experts, clinicians, and providers on the interprofessional team. And there were several recommendations that came out of this task force, but one of them in, specific, in particular does relate to tapering and wanting to emphasize the opportunity to leverage interprofessional efforts in that space. And, and so that does give a large reason for um, why we wanted to contribute to this paper. So with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Dr. Rich. Anna, good afternoon, and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you again for that introduction, Anna. And again, I, I echo your thoughts in terms of the contribution that NAM has, has made to this subject and the subject of opioid and pain management in general. Without NAM's sponsorship and work, again, I think, again, there would be a lot of work left to do on the subject. So, again, my thanks to Aisha and NAM and the other staff at NAM. I also like to thank again today at PQA for the invitation today. Again, it's a, it's an honor to talk to your group today and talk to again the individuals working in the industry in the field to help deal with this this issue. Uh, next slide. Again, I'm talking today about the tenets of the paper. I'm starting with a brief brief a brief background slide. Then we'll go into key points and again key research gaps and future priorities. Most of you are aware of the issues that we've had with chronic and cancerous pain, how it has evolved over the preceding decades to include a high rate of opioid allergies that uses, particularly in rural areas, which is where I practice. As you know, the evidence base for opioid use in chronic non-cancerous pain has been slim, and naturally there are harms associated with uses. 
Into that background, as you know, the CDC 2016 guideline, as well as other guidelines, have been developed to help guide the use of opioids for the management of, of chronic non-cancer pain and now even acute pain. One, top, one patient population which has not been adequately addressed very well in a lot of the guidelines is what has been labeled as the legacy patient by many of us in, in the business. Typically, a chronic lung cancer pain patient who is already on long-acting opioid therapy, oftentimes in high doses or in combination with benzos or other hypnotics. And particularly in the primary care setting, providers and patients are left with decisions about what do you do, how do you manage these patients, how do you manage the medications, and should you taper, and how do you taper? Because of that, NAM helped sponsor again this paper again which is highlighting the best practices and the current research gaps and again this is an effort to help guide the discussion as we go forth in terms of how to better do the job of opioid tapering and hopefully also how to guide future research priorities. As again a moment of personal privilege again I would identify myself I am a primary care physician working in a rural area in southeastern North Carolina on a per capita basis, the county that I live in and surrounding counties has had historically some of the highest rates of opioid prescribing per capita and as certainly associated with that unintended consequences including accidental overdose and death. So this is a personal error for me that I've labored at for years in terms of trying to work at, trying to improve the prescribing, manage with these patients, and again, hopefully lead to the development of uh, again research and other recommendations to help guide what we do. Next slide. I'll begin with a discussion of key points. First one is relative intuitive, the benefits of tapering. As you can imagine, and as you know, again, by tapering again, we do have to lower the risk of accidental overdose and death, that's intuitive. We have lessened again by tapering side effects from local use, which many patients acknowledge, such as itching, constipation, and other side effects when they're questioned. Certainly, again, there is a decreased burden on disease processes by tapering, such as in patients who have lung disease and liver disease. We have high-risk populations, again, which we certainly want to look at minimizing the usage of opioids for chronic pain, such as youth and pregnant, and pregnant women. And one important area, again, which is sometimes actually overlooked and not well recognized, but was pointed out by the paper by Fisher and Pulakow in 2019, that by tapering a subset of this population of patients on chronic opioid therapy, you actually improve their pain and their average level of functioning. Mental fog clears, and in instances, patients will come back and say, by tapering, my pain actually is improved. This may re reflect the phenomena of opioid hyperanalgesia, but clearly there is a patient population group which is improved by tapering. Next slide. Conversely, we do recognize that there are some concerns about opioid tapering. Certainly the question of worsening pain is something that patients always are concerned about, but has to be addressed. And those patients that are on long-term usage you may unmask unpreviously diagnosed or unrecognized opioid dependency and its consequences. Similarly, in a very important population that sometimes is not adequately recognized in those patients which are already on therapy is that they may have significant underlying behavioral health issues which have not been met and have not been addressed and certainly contribute to the, the desire the, the feeling that patients must continue opioid therapy to help manage their pain, where in many respects, they're actually treating, in some respects, their emotional pain with medications for physical pain. And lastly, again, certainly again, in a, those patients which are abruptly discontinued or tapering or tapered inappropriately, you can certainly precipitate withdrawal, which has to be addressed and the consequences of the withdrawal to the patient. Anecdotally, and I'll address this in a later slide in terms of research, there are some anecdotal reports of patient harm such as inadvertent overdose and other type issues which have occurred from tapering, although again, the evidence base to support that is very slim at this time. Next slide. As I mentioned, one of the areas, one of the key points that, of the paper was reminding everyone to focus on and recognize the, the significant occurrence of behavioral health issues in this patient population. 
The exact percentage, again, of these patients, again, is still left to be determined, but we do know from the surveys which we've seen that there are a significant percentage of patients that do have underlying behavioral health concerns. And those concerns include such things as you may consider, as you may recognize such as depression, personality disorder, and unrecognized substance use disorders. We do recommend as part of the tenets of the paper to make use of screening tools for behavioral disorders. These are available to use, again, with this patient population, both during the therapy and certainly, again, at any point during the tapering process. I will talk a little bit about pharmacologic therapies and non-pharmacologic therapies in a slide to come. But nevertheless, there clearly is room for managing behavioral health conditions in these patients which have previously not been addressed. There's a sudden, there is a, certainly there is a category of patients, those patients with underlying substance use disorder, which when addressed, actually the, the point of therapy actually shifts from actually, actually undergoing opioid tapering to actually treatment of their underlying substance use disorder. Uh, there is a category that we'll touch on briefly in, in another slide talking about how patients now are actually now utilizing substance abuse therapy and those patients as a tapering aid that do not have substance use disorder, but again, they may benefit from the use of therapy to help treat substance use disorder. Next slide. One of the important areas in the topic of, again, managing these patients is shared decision-making. As I've already alluded to, these patients have significant concerns that, is my pain going to worsen? Am I going to be left in a less functional status if you tapering my medications? This has to be addressed, as well as concerns about withdrawal and some of the stigma, the stigma which may be associated with withdrawal. We have advocated through the paper again that there is a significant place for the subject of shared decision making in the tapering process. And we firmly recommend that it be done via a supportive mechanism, addressing those patient concerns about tapering. I will also emphasize again that as, as you may imagine, this is not something which happens immediately and may often require repeated visits with repeated conversations about the importance of tapering to obtain that patient buy-in. As part of that discussion, oftentimes I've included such things as the benefits of tapering, how we may affect your pain and function, how we're going to address possible withdrawal symptoms, what an endpoint for tapering may be, and even address the somewhat ill-defined subject of the speed of tapering. Motivational interview, interviewing is a tool which can be used, and I'll allude to this probably as we go through the rest of the, my slides. Next slide. Speed of tapering, again, as I just already mentioned again, there are significant evidence gaps regarding recommended speeds of tapering. The research regarding speed of tapering is minimal. It certainly is in need of longer duration studies looking at the risk versus benefits. Most guidelines, including the 2016 CDC guideline as well as others, have kind of gone with, again, a consensus of recommendation, which in essence implies that the higher the dose and the longer duration of the long-term opioid use, the slower the taper. Additionally, as you can imagine, each taper must be individualized and no one size fits all. Uh, as I've noted again, most guidelines talking about have utilized consensus recommendation. The CDC guideline, as an example, talked about 10% reduction over one to four weeks. You can see all kinds of variations of it. One tool, one or two tools that I have, and the paper recommends as, a, as an adjunct to taper, is to consider objective tools to obtain objective measurements of pain and function such as the PEG scale, which is mentioned in the CDC guideline, and the quality of life scale by the American Chronic Pain Association. These are two of the most common scales. There are other scales out there. The important point being, again, making use of a, of a scale or a tool such as this may help to guide you through the process of objectively tapering these patients. Next slide. Adjunct to tapering. Briefly, again, these are tools which we have recommended to be considered for use in tapering. The goal of the use of these tools is to optimize pain management in such a way that opioids 
really have less utility that again you're optimizing treatment of coexisting conditions such as behavioral health issues and you use these tools to help to facilitate the communication between the patient and provider. I've mentioned again various non-pharmacologic therapies as a tool such as cognitive behavioral therapy, chiropractic therapy, which is a personal favorite of mine in the community that I practice, as well as physical therapy and other non-pharmacologic modalities. There's various pharmacologic therapies, as we kind of already alluded to, again, in Anna's presentation, such as the use of NSAIDs, acetaminophens, antidepressants, and anticonvulsants. As Lisa also alluded to, interdisciplinary teams, be they a formalized team or an informal team in a rural area such as mine, my community pharmacists are valuable contributors to that process. And without their work of the community pharmacy, it would make my job much more difficult in terms of being able to taper these individuals. We mentioned a tapering agreement, which is very similar to a pain contract. The purpose of this tool is just to help clarify the conditions endpoints at other points of the tapering process so that if there's ever a, dis, uh, a misunderstanding between you and the patient, you have something to help guide the discussion for this is what we agreed into, this is how we're going to do the process. Again, a communication tool. Next slide. Again, endpoint, again, uh, suffice it to say, in many patients, the endpoint of tapering is not tapering to zero usage of opioids is tapering to the lowest effective dose based upon assessments of their pain and function and risk versus benefits. Again, one size does not fit all. One patient, most patients that are on long acting or long standing long term opioid therapy may not get to that, that desired cutoff of 50 milligram morphine equivalents or lower. Again, it may be a higher dosage. From my own example through the years, I've taken, I've taken care of several patients which were on several hundred milligram morphine equivalents daily, and getting those to half of that dosage was my endpoint. I do emphasize, and we have emphasized in the paper, that tapering will probably take months to even years. And as a rule of thumb, it typically takes longer than, than you may ever anticipate. As I said, the endpoint is not complete dis discontinuation the tapering to the lowest effective dose. Next slide. Again, just briefly, we're gonna talk about research gaps and future priorities. Next slide. Again, speed of, I'm gonna go through this kind of quickly, speed of taper. Again, there is no, there is very little evidence to help guide the appropriate speed for tapering, particularly for different patient populations, those on high dosages, those with suspected opioid use disorders, as well as underlying uh, coexisting behavioral health disorders. There is some active research ongoing about speed of tapering, but much more is needed, particularly in terms of, again, the long-term risks versus benefits of tapering speed and how it may apply to certain patient populations. We've already kind of alluded to the longer these individuals have been on opioid therapy, the longer the taper. Again, you're just it's just going to take that much longer. Next slide. Adjunctive therapies, again, the goal of these therapies, again, is to, again, maximize, again, the care of the patient's additional underlying disorders, as well as to lessen their, their usage of, again, opioid therapies. I've already kind of alluded to some of the pharmacologic and non-pharmacologic therapies. We need further research in terms of which therapies are beneficial which therapies are not, how they should best be used. And an important thing, again, if we have an improved evidence base for these adjunctive therapies, this can then help expand insurance coverage for those therapies. Next slide. Interdisciplinary teams, such as, again, what Anna previously talked about, we see a, an, an improving role or an expanding role for the use of interdisciplinary teams for tapering. Again, research is needed in terms of which personnel should be participate as part of a tapering team, which type of integrative care is beneficial, when that care should be employed in the process, how it should be used in the process. Certainly, again, we need longer studies with larger patient pools, patient pools, but certainly, again, there clearly is a role for interdisciplinary teams which can further define with, again, further research. And again, if we have evidence for this, we can certainly then obtain further approval for insurance coverage of the services. Next slide. As I alluded to 
open use disorder therapies, again, certainly are beneficial to those patients who have an underlying substance use disorder. There is a category of, of providers who are increasingly utilizing opioid use disorder therapies as a transition therapy for those patients which do not have an underlying substance use disorder. Again, we need further information about how these medications are used. Should they be used? When should you transfer a patient to these therapies? What should the speed of tapering be if you utilize these therapies? What do you do after, again, they've been tapered off or you've completed tapering, et cetera? Again, and one policy question that, I include, that I've included in here as an adjunct, which is, which is active being looked at now, is if you're utilizing opioid therapy for tapering only, do you need waiver training and do you need to have that waiver later license? Next slide. Polypharmacy, a significant area of, of uh, problem for many of us that are working in the field, working with these patients. What do you do with these individuals that are already on benzodiazepines, hypnotics, muscle relaxers, and other sedating medications? Which one do you taper first? How do you taper concurrently? Whether you should taper one category of medication before the other? The speed of tapering. Lots of questions which which are left unanswered regarding, again, the polypharmacy patient. And I readily admit this is probably the greatest area of problem that I have in terms of working with these patients. How do you deal with these patients and which ones do you taper first? Next slide. Behavioral health, again, I emphasize, again, we need better research into, again, optimal treatments for behavioral health conditions. How do you better define those conditions in the setting of chronic pain? and opioid tapering, which behavioral therapies may be of benefit, when to start those therapies, how long do you continue, their role in maintenance after a successful taper, including again, continuation of these pair therapies to help maintain the, the a successful taper. Uh, next slide. Finally, risk versus benefits. Again, we need better evidence regarding the associated benefits and risk of tapering. As I've already alluded to, we know there are benefits to opioid tapering. We know less about the risk of opioid tapering, particularly since it includes mostly anecdotal reports. Longer duration, higher quality research is needed into the risk versus the benefits of tapering and how this all, uh, again, fits into managing the chronic lung cancer's pain on long-term opioid therapy. And with that, that concludes my section and I'll pass it off to Lisa Hines. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thanks to all of you, Aisha, Anna, and Tuck. Um, it's it's an honor to be presenting with you today. Appreciate you spending the time to talk about the Opioid Action Collaborative as well as this discussion paper. I just briefly want to touch on where PQA's quality measures intersect with with this work. We have a set of eight opioid prescribing measures. Our measures are intended for health plan or state evaluation and use claims data um, retrospectively. So they focus on high dose opioid prescribing multiple providers, and that includes pharmacies and, pre and prescribers. There's a composite measure, concurrent use of opioids and benzos. And then those were our first four measures um, that we developed um, starting back in 2015. And then we have three newer measures that are, we expect to have greater uptake because they look at earlier use, so new starts that can contribute to subsequent chronic use and potentially misuse of opioids. And they look at high dosage, long duration, and um, long acting or extended release opioids. And then most recently, we added to our portfolio annual monitoring for persons on long-term opioid therapy. Um, and, and this is an important measure that's extremely guideline and evidence-based um, that can promote uh, safe opioid prescribing. Next slide. So all of the measures on this slide are endorsed by the National Quality Forum, including uh, in addition to endorsement by PQA membership, and QF endorsement represents a, a best in class. So. Um, these measures are broadly used in CMS quality programs, and here's some examples. The high dose and multiple provider and concurrent use of opioids and benzodiazepines and initial opioids for long duration are used by Medicare Part D. We have two measures in the Medicaid adult core set, 
and uh, we have one measure that's used in the health insurance marketplace quality rating system. So we really like to see alignment of the measures that are used over time across CMS quality program. And then on the next slide, just want to highlight uh, the the national use, um, the wide, um, broad, broad scale use of our measures across the United States in regional and state quality programs, including value-based um, arrangements. And uh, there's over 31 states that are involved in 1115 Medicaid substance use disorder waivers that use four of our measures. Um, some great research collaboratives, so a lot of synergy and state dashboards that um, that include our opioid measures as well. So um, we're really thrilled to have um, some tools such as um, best practices in opioid tapering to um, help to manage those legacy patients. Um, so we just really see that um, the Opioid Action Collaborative is really promoting um, the best practices and the PQA measures can be in the background to um, be monitoring populations of patients uh, related to opioid prescribing over time. Um, but we do emphasize that our measures should be used in a balanced set of measures that also look at things like shared decision making and um, that appropriate identification and treatment of substance use disorder. And with that, I will hand it over to Amanda, who will uh, moderate some of our questions. Okay, thank you so much, Lisa, and also thanks to our entire panel today for sharing your insights with us on opioid tapering and all the work that you have done in this area. We do have time for a few questions, so I would like to remind the audience, if you do have questions, please feel free to enter those in the panel, the question panel over on the right side of your screen, and we can address those um, with our speakers for the rest of the time available today. So first question I would like to address to Aisha. Um, we've got some participants that are interested in how they might get involved with the Action Collaborative. Sure, thank you so much um, for that question. Amanda, there are certainly a couple of ways to, a couple of different ways to be involved with the Action Collaborative. Um, first and foremost, I would definitely um, say to visit, to visit the Action Collaborative website. Um, all of our um, tools and resources are posted there, and we also have a sign up for a listserv. Um, and what we do through our um, listserv announcements is um, provide updates on um, our current work. Um, we also host several public webinars um, and usually have um, large meetings that happen um, a couple of times a year and are often open to the public. Um, and we also have opportunities for um, uh, specific calls uh, for public input, um, again, to help inform the work that we're doing. So that's a great way to uh, learn kind of what the collaborative is doing um, at large. Um, and I would also say that if, um, if there's anyone who is here today that's a part of an organization, um, that is focused on the opioid crisis and um, our priority areas align with um, some of the work that you're doing. Um, you also have the opportunity to join um, one of our, become one of our uh, network, organization, network organizations and join that group. Um, you can submit a commitment statement and, and be a part of a collab our collaborative that way. Um, and we're also, uh, you know, always looking for opportunities to um, engage ind individuals into um, our review process for our discussion papers, um, as well as other materials, um, and serve as, as speakers for our events. So lots of different ways to, to be involved, but I would certainly start with the website, and um, you can always feel free to reach out to me as well if you have additional questions. All right, thanks so much, Aisha. Aisha, we appreciate that. Uh, next question, um, I will address first to Anna. Chuck might have uh, something to add to this as well. The question is, is where does a pharmacist have a role in shared decision-making? And I suppose this is specifically a focus, of course, on opioid tapering. And uh, Anna, do you have anything you could contribute about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, it, and that that is a critical piece. And that's something that came out in discussions with Action Collaborative and as it relates to this paper is how critical it is that this is a shared decision between patients and and um, 
and healthcare professionals. And um, and, and I'd just like to add too, that's something that the NAM Action Collaborative has done exceptionally well is bringing in the voice of those with lived experiences to help inform our work. They've brought just an invaluable perspective to these discussions and it has really added um, a very important layer to this discussion. And so um, pharmacists are, um, they can help meet that, uh, that, that um, area of unmet need. They can start, you know, they, they know their patients. Um, they can start by having some of those trusted conversations based on observations they might see with the patient and um, their, their medication profile, seeing maybe where there are some red flags and then having a trusted conversation with that patient just to start to have the dialogue and then um, and then to act as that triage point to connect patient to to the, the rest of the healthcare team to um, bring in another layer of support. So I think this is such an important area for there to be um, an all hands on deck approach for patients, for their communities and overall just to work on this from a national perspective to get a better handle on managing pain and minimizing um, opioid um, misuse. And, and Amanda, I would second again, all that Anna said, and I would say as a alluded to already my community pharmacists are part of the team they oftentimes may have more time to talk with the patient about the medications risks versus benefits and they our community pharmacists are invaluable in reinforcing again the goal of tapering and how we're doing it and some of the reasons for doing it without their backup again it makes my job much more difficult when we're trying to talk about tapering with the patient Okay, thank you, Anna and Chuck. Um, definitely sounds like a team-based approach is something you all have emphasized today. So um, thank you for giving us some particulars on that. Um, Chuck, another question uh, for you, and this is really about how we can support or provide some advice perhaps to primary care providers on how to implement a lot of the best practices that we've talked about today. So there's a lot of assessment tools, the PEG scale, um, opioid risk tool, there's counseling involved with all of the work that a primary care provider is involved in. You know, how, how do you incorporate that into every visit? What sort of practical tips do you have to to share. I go back to our actual our previous our previous question. It's a team-based approach. I depend upon my nurse to assist me in the process in terms of particularly administering some of the tools, helping to provide some of the screening information that we need as we go as we're assessing risk versus benefits. I'm depending upon my pharmacy. I'm depending upon family members even to help in terms of the process. I readily agree if the primary care provider is trying to undertake this process alone without a team-based approach, it's very difficult to do. And you clearly need the assistance of these other individuals as well as additional therapy services, such as, again, as I mentioned, behavioral health, uh, physical therapy, et cetera. Again, all of these services must be brought into play. It does take time. These discussions, our process, it takes time. You're not going to develop it overnight. So I emphasize patience and understanding. All right. Thank you, Chuck. A lot, a lot to think about and a lot to balance. And again, team-based approach, very important. So thank you for that response. Uh, we've got time for one more question. Um, I will hand this one to Lisa. Has PQA considered developing any measures or a measure perhaps focused on opioid tapering specifically? Thanks, Amanda. Um, we have considered that. We don't know what that could look like. And I'd say that at the one of the first things that we think about is the potential for unintended consequences. So we would hate for a measure to drive tapering that is not following the evidence and best practices. So one of the ideas we have is um, perhaps something like a process measure or patient reported outcome measure um, in highlighting the, um, the shared decision making in particular. Um, and that would require clinical data sources, of course, but that's what our thinking has been so far. We're open to ideas, of course, though. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Yes, definitely an area where a lot of information is to come. So uh, thank you for sharing your thoughts on that. 
that is all the time that we have for today. I wanted to thank our panel again for taking some time to share all of their knowledge and work with our participants today, and would like to remind our participants to please answer the brief survey that will appear as this webinar concludes. And then one more reminder, both the recording and the slides will be distributed within the next week, and they will also be made available on our website. Uh, please do make plans to join us for our next Quality Forum webinar, which will be on February 25th. Thanks to our panelists, thanks to our attendees for coming, and have a great afternoon, everyone.